Hi, I'm Zoe Braderman. Mm -hmm. I'm an OWASP chapter leader and chair of the Women in AppSec Committee within OWASP and an InfoSec Girls New York chapter leader. And we'll introduce Vandana in a moment. Um, so I'm going to talk about diversity and both the absolute necessity of it in our industry and also various diversity leaders' perspective of it. Um, and I'm going to let them each inter introduce themselves before I ask them questions. But beforehand, I wanted to say that I have two global board members of the OS Foundation on the panel. Big title, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Big, so well deserved. Round of applause is hardcore at the end. Um, and I have other global and national um, diversity and inclusion um, leaders of their, each, each of their nonprofit organizations. And I have, you know, people who have served in the military and, you know, started their own open source initiatives and all these titles, all these titles. But, um, but the, you know, one, one of the points about diversity that I want to really drive home is that they're so humble and always learning from each other, which is really diversity. And I just know them as people I've had amazing conversations with and gotten to know and love a lot. And each have their own really, really strong stories about how they entered the industry and what they do for the industry and what it means, both the community and the technology itself. So I'm going to let you each introduce yourselves. Starting with Vandana. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vandana. Uh, I'm one of the global board of directors of OWASP. OWASP is Open Web Application Security Project, and we are here for AppSec Cali. Uh, I'm also one of the chapter leader for OWASP Bangalore, and uh, I am one of the president for InfoSec Girls. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my name is Malia. I'm one of the veterans that she mentioned on the panel. Um, I'm also the president and founder of WESA SoCal. It's Women in Cybersecurity. It's a national nonprofit. I'm also the affiliate development liaison for that as well, which is kind of fun. Um, I'm also chair of the technology committee for Anita Bjorg, which if you don't know that, they put on the largest women in tech conference in the world. We had 26,000 ladies attending last year. Um, and last year, in addition to all of that, I founded my own company. So don't ask me when I sleep. <laughs> I got to learn all of that from you, and so should everybody. I'm Kavya Perlman. I am the cybersecurity strategist for Wallarm, a company sort of dedicated to using machine learning and artificial intelligence to improve API security and cloud native security. Uh, besides that, uh, I'm also the CEO of XR Safety Initiative. This is a nonprofit organization dedicated to building safe, immersive environments via augmented, virtual, mixed reality. Um, today, I'm just so honored and humbled to sit in the company of such an amazing, beautiful, intelligent, remarkable leaders, and I hope to make my contribution along the way and learn from them. My name is Chris Kubeka, and I am a cyber warfare expert and a nation state incident management expert that advises uh, several governments around the world, also uh, one of Google's subject matter experts for IoT, and the German Marshall Fund's subject matter expert for cybersecurity matters. And uh, in addition to that, I also speak at various United Nations events and so forth. I'm also one of the other military veterans uh, on this particular panel. So, thank you. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Yep. Morning, it's the morning. <laughs> Nonetheless, I'm Lisa Jiggets, um, founder of Women's Society Cyber Jitsu. My day job is um, pen testing. My other day job is the nonprofit. <laughs> Do the math. <laughs> um, and I'm also one of the other vets, uh, so I'm glad to be here and share some insight with you guys. Hi, I'm Rich Greenberg. Um, 
I am on the OWASP Global Board. It's elected position. Vanden and I were lucky enough to convince enough people to vote for us. Um, I also uh, run the local Los Angeles OWASP chapter. Um, I run the local ISSA chapter, which is the Information System Security Association. Everyone in this room who's local should attend our meetings every month. They're on the third or fourth Wednesday. Great talks, great networking opportunities. And um, I'm a former CISO. And uh, a lot of what Alex said in the keynote resonated with me as far as what CISO life is like and post-CISO work. Um, but I'm just honored to be here with these great people. And uh, Kavya, thank you. Uh, no one's ever called me beautiful before, so I appreciate that. <laughs> First time for everything. Um, OK. So first I wanted to each of you to go through what your organization or organizations do for women and one for women and minorities and diversity as a whole and why you feel that particular activity is um, a, of necessity to the industry as a whole and to teams and securing software in other areas of technology. Thank you. So um, with OWASP, we know that it's an inclusive community. It's not just AppSec, but including all forms of people uh, and uh, all, uh, all forms of tech. So we have people here who are not part of AppSec, but they want to learn AppSec. And um, when we say OWASP, it's not just OWASP top 10. There are many wonderful projects associated with it. We have, uh, we, we have Builder Projects, Defender, and there are many more things associated with it. When I talk about InfoSec Girls, uh, we started with the, just wanted to be a space for, a safe space for girls to be part of information security. But then as we grew, now uh, our motive was to have not just girls, but inclusive space for all of us. We started teaching in schools, we teach Scratch, Python, and a few more languages in the schools. We go and tell them what technology is all about. It's not like, it's, it's a rocket science. You have to, if you start early, there's nothing impossible. There's nothing for him or her. It's for all of us. Um, we go to uh, colleges, we train on cybersecurity, and uh, we also provide uh, conference passes. We associate with them and uh, provide the scholarships to them. There are a few more things which have happened in the past wherein we wanted to share knowledge with the global audience. So we started a YouTube channel wherein we can spread awareness and there have been uh, cases wherein uh, most of the ladies have been on the uh, InfoSec Girls YouTube channel and we are really, really privileged to have them. And uh, it's basically to share knowledge and connect with each other. That's what diversity is all about. Okay. So I'll talk about the, I guess the easiest one first is Anita Bjorg. So it's it's actually been around for one, I say now, 20, 25 years. And um, the Grace Hopper conference, it was for Vice Admiral Grace, Grace Hopper. She served for 38 years in the Navy. She's one of the longest serving people in the Navy. Um, was my idol when I was serving in the Navy. And, but funnily enough, I didn't find out about the conference till I left the Navy. And I was like, I need to go to this thing. Um, and it's, it's a great space where people in all aspects of technology can go and share their knowledge and, you know, welcoming of folks who are non-binary or who are male, not just to this women's conference. And it's awesome to see everybody get along and everybody feel safe and comfortable. And it was such a profound experience for me. And I loved it. And that's why I wanted to get involved. Um, and it, which is actually where I found out about women in cybersecurity. I didn't realize being the only woman in the space that there were apparently dozens of us. Um, so I went to that conference and I was like, wow, this is a really awesome group of academics. It's people in the military, it's people in government, and it's all facets of cybersecurity. And it was one of the coolest experiences. And one thing I'm really proud of with WESIS is we are so inclusive. You know, we always say, hey, allies welcome, non-binary. You know, as long as you are not rude, come on down. We want everybody to learn about this. Um, and especially like 
come on, bring, bring developers, bring people in sales, bring others, people. And we've had really cool experiences. Like just recently, we did an intro to CTF where the vast majority of people in the room weren't in cybersecurity by the end of the event, everybody's asking me, how do I get more involved? How do I learn more about this? And that is one thing that I've found really awesome about, you know, getting involved and doing this organization and opening the doors to everybody because everybody should care about cybersecurity. And it's how we get more people in. And we've been blessed to have some really awesome allies. There's some in the audience here. Thank you for coming and supporting us. And that's what it's all about. So yeah, just be inclusive, no matter of your backgrounds, no matter what your industry, you know, that's, that's my passion. Awesome. I actually um, wanted Lisa to be the next one to answer this question. I have other questions for the three of you. Okay. So um, I apologize if you have heard the story before, but it kind of gives the gist of how WSC was founded. So back when 2012, I was, um, you know, really wanted to step up my game in hacking and was part of some uh, hacker groups, um, mostly guys. It fell apart. I didn't have anywhere to go that I felt comfortable. Um, and the comfortable piece is also being the only woman in advanced boot camp. You know, I was not raising my hand for various reasons because I was intimidated, fill in the blank. So I was like, by that time I had learned some stuff, right? And I was like, you know what? I know I wonder if there's other women out there like me that want to learn this stuff. So I started a meetup group, then LLC, which turned into the nonprofit a year later. Um, the first workshop I taught was what intro to Backtrack, which is now Cali and uh, Linux. And we had like 12 women show up. I was like, wow, okay. And we had a couple people online. I was like, okay, there's something here. So my scope was very narrow in the beginning. I wanted to have a place for women to come to that felt comfortable in a, in a comfortable learning space, right? Now our, our scope has narrowed. And the following year, I was like, you know what? What about the girls? You know, we, they're coming after us, so we have to do something. So we started Cyber Jitsu Girls Academy, which is middle school, high school uh, STEM programs. We do that once a month. Not out here, but um, right, uh, on the East Coast right now. So obviously we've grown since 2012 and uh, you know, we're not looking back, we're expanding. We do have a chapter here as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think uh, had there been all these groups now, I, pr I wouldn't have started it. <laughs> I didn't have anywhere to go back then, so that's why I started it. And uh, yeah, and lastly, I wanted to say, WESIS is a great con and organization. That's how I met Malia. So um, I love that we have all these orgs um, out there now, you know, collaborating, working together, and, and doing good for the, um, the bigger cause here. So thank you. Wonderful, awesome. Yep. If you could hand it back to Kavya, I wanna ask another yeah. question to Kavya and Chris. So words. Big, probably scary to many words like extended reality or cyber warfare. When you say that that's what you're doing, what is what are people's typical gut reactions? And are they just mesmerized? I imagine they are. And that mysticism, that sense of mysticism and admiration and probably some fear, um, what correlated or associated opportunities are there for diversity behind those big words and what they actually entail in their future? Go ahead, Chris. Well, <laughs> yay, no pressure, all right. Um, yes, uh, most people when they first meet me and look at me and they ask me what I do for a living and I tell them I'm a cyber warfare expert, they certainly uh, don't quite expect that. Uh, just like uh, most people, when I tell them that I'm a military veteran, they don't expect that. And uh, this is one of the reasons why these organizations are set up and why additional organizations for various reasons have to be set up for diversity. Now, one of the problems with warfare and cyber warfare uh, is the fact that um, in our particular case, we have basically digital bombs coming at us at the speed of light. We already have a shortage of people in this particular field. There are definitely not enough men to fill this whole cyber field to protect things like critical infrastructure, to protect applications, so on and so forth. And it's one of these cases, I go back to World War II, where it is definitely our Rosie the Riveter moment, where we all have to step up. 
and we all ha have to defend our modern world because our economies depend upon it. And diversity is absolutely required. Your adversary is not, may or may not look exactly like you, so you have to have different perspectives. You have to have different language skills. You have to have different religious backgrounds. You have to look at the diversity and gain different perspectives. And that's one of the things that I push to various governments when I speak to them about getting more diverse security teams to do this. So one thing that I want to add to Chris's whole thing is um, we are also collaborating on the same subject, cyber war. And uh, we're going to talk about this through a webinar in a week's time. So pay attention to like sort of expanded answers as to how her expertise is really necessary for application security. Uh, now, I want to talk about virtual worlds. Uh, but before that, I think the two key experiences that drove me to start this XR safety initiatives are sort of important to mention. Um, and then I'll give you two sort of historic announcements to sort of go along with it so you can remember this moment. Uh, the first thing is, uh, I just found myself advising Facebook during 2016 U.S. presidential election. So I learned about the risks of third parties, what happens when they're ignored, and what are the application, information security, all of these type of risks that should be accounted for. Thereafter, I was the head of security for anybody gamers out here? Gamers? Ever heard of Second Life? Right? The very first virtual world founded about 16 years ago. So for about two, almost two years, I was protecting two virtual economies because they also started a virtual reality-based virtual world. At that point, I realized that all of the risks that we face in the real world, in the application security domain, in the cyber warfare domain, in fact, there are terrorist activities that actually go down through these massive multiplayer online gaming-like environment that are now coming to virtual reality where you can use head-mounted goggles to immerse yourself in these environments. And they feel so compelling and real that the psychological impact on humans is detrimental. So I'll just give you one instance, for example. I was inside this virtual environment and this one particular person who was a creator just yelled at me, screamed at me and say, F you this, Linden Lab, F you that, F you that. And I was just like appalled for three days. And I'm really passionate about VR. For three days, I was saddened. I didn't even step back into VR. So now there is this whole like, oh, she yelled at me because I'm Muslim. Would she yell at people if they are different than you? So all of these societal risks are coming to virtual environments eventually, inevitably. Um, I was also the first person to organize gay pride parade in virtual reality, in this immersive environment where we had like wings that were like, you know, rainbow looking wings, all these glowy stuff. That is important. Because if we won't step up and say it, these environments would be built without us, without these voices. Some people actually said, oh, she's bringing in Sharia law. Are you kidding me? My first name is Hindu. My last name is Jewish and I practice Islam and my religion is really love. So these are really important aspects of diversity, inclusion that we got to face and sort of build together as we are building this virtual reality, augmented reality. You guys use Snapchat filters all the time. Those are application code. <laughs> like we need to protect these things because at some point we're gonna be ordering our Uber through these glasses. This is not an AR enabled glass, but <laughs> one of these days I want one. And when you do the payment, you need to check the payment integrity. You need to abide by PCI, all of this stuff. It's like a huge domain that needs cyber war defenders, cybersecurity experts, AppSec experts, and that's why we got to come together, and that's why I started this initiative, and I'm gonna continue learn from you guys 
and you guys. Awesome. Thank you both so much. And you are both badasses. You are all badasses, OK? <laughs> That's pretty obvious. So Richard, what are some of your experience? Oh. <laughs> what are some of your experiences um, managing diverse teams? Um, while I was sitting here listening, I started thinking about my history. Um, maybe just share a couple of things. I, I grew up in Manhattan, the ultimate melting pot. I had no concept, really, of people that were different. To me, we were all people. That's how I was brought up, and that's how I lived in Manhattan. True integration and, and, and everything. Here, there is a lot of diversity, but there's still a lot of segregated areas where people live. It is different. Um, as I grew up, um, I went to elementary school in Harlem. I went to college in Harlem. I played in a gay softball team. I marched in the gay pride parade. I raised money when I came out here for um, the AIDS dance-a-thon. So throughout my life, it's just, I don't even think about it. It's just, this is what you do. You want to help people and make everyone inclusive. Um, and I was shocked when, because I, you know, I live in two international cities, right, where people are usually looked upon in a nice way, right, open and inclusive. Uh, there are other areas of the country and the world where this is not the case. So my experience is I didn't see a whole lot of negativity from that perspective. But then I started connecting with more people on Twitter in our field, and I was absolutely shocked at some of the horrible things that women in our field are experiencing. I, how can this be? People outwardly taunting them, questioning, you know, threatening them at cons because they posted something, trying to shut down women. I, I, how can this be? But this is the reality of the world we live in. And so I started to feel, I have to do something because I took for granted living here. I didn't have to do anything. At all our meetings, at our meetups, people are friendly and warm and welcoming. But this is an enlightened city, right? <laughs> but I still make it a point now at almost every OWASP and ISSA meeting, right, when I kick it off and welcome everybody, I stress the point that this is an open society, an open community. We have to, you know, be sensitive to minorities and women, and we want to be inclusive. And I make that point. Uh, just like I did this morning, I talked about the zero tolerance for OWASP at the conference. This is something. So I just want to reiterate it, but I also want to share with people that at, a, at their job, at their place of business, there's stuff happening at a low level, maybe subconsciously, that people don't notice or see. Because there's a difference between men and women quite a bit. And what I mean by that is, for example, um, when there's published positions that are open, right? What do you see? What kind of language do you see? And people don't think about this. Come join our team, we'll kick ass, we'll win, we'll win, right? That's male-dominated warfare or, or team sport language, which more women are getting into that, right, as we can see. But it's still, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't really appeal to a lot of women who just want to do a good job and, and enjoy life and build their career. Right, so they might not even apply for those positions. Right, so the subtle language differences, which we don't even, right, I'm sure the person who wrote it wasn't thinking that way, but maybe they were. Maybe they're thinking, oh, this is a cyber field, it's male dominated, let's appeal to men, right? But maybe it's subconsciously. So we have to be careful about the unintentional consequences of some of the actions that are subliminally happening because of our society. I mean, the Civil Rights Act was 64, that's not that far back. Right? And, it's, and it's taken, it still hasn't even been enacted properly in a lot of areas of the South. Right? So there's still in this country you know, a fair amount of racism and bias. And so we have to be sensitive to that. Right? And again, living out here, I don't see much of it, really. Right? But the cyber world's full of it. And so at work, you have to be particularly diligent and not just take it for granted. Oh, well, where we work, every, it's open and, and we love everybody. Yeah, there are people there that come from different backgrounds and upbringing. Remember, this is an area people come from all over the country to come here and in the world because of, well, look outside, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so you are going to bring in with that some negativity. And so we have to be careful. And if you see it or hear it, don't just turn the other way. You have to speak up. 
That's the key. And in, in the men in the audience, it's really important that we speak up. And it's not just the women, right? Because it's harder. If you're getting attacked, you're feeling, you know, but if you see it, speak up. That's really crucial. Thank you so much. I'm really glad we have you on the panel specifically. It's important what you say. Always you. dedicated. Cool. So what are your thoughts, um, all of you in each of your given daily roles, great positive op you know, experiences with some area of diverse contribution? Direction. Vandana. <laughs> we started that direction. We're going to continue that direction. Yeah. Management. So uh, management is basically when we start looking at things which are necessary. As Richard said, that we need to look at the words that we are saying because it's, it matters. That when we say we want to be inclusive, we have to watch our words. They might not sound that we are pointing out at someone, but they may be. So uh, filtering is very important. And uh, now every company, every organization, everyone talks about that we want to be uh, we want to hire diversity, we want to be inclusive, we want this kind of a people, that. But then you have to have some kind of a policy defined that yes, we want these people. And you have to say it out loud. Um, there was one survey conducted, actually two surveys. One said that there are only 11% of the population in cybersecurity is women or diversity. And the recent one says 20%. Now, the number is growing, but it's going to take time. And how we can improve that? We all have to lay down certain rules, um, certain recommendations that how we can do it and talk it out. Uh, there have been uh, talks when I am talking to my mentors. There are a lot of my mentors are men. So when I am talking to them, this word diversity um, comes as a very uh, tricky, uh, tricky word. Or sometimes they, uh, when, when we say that women feel intimidated, men also do feel intimidated. That happened. So it's, uh, we all have to talk it out. It's not just one person has to talk about or one gender, it's all of us. And on the same front, uh, we have to look out as uh, part of the community, seek out for help. That's very important. We always step back and uh, don't try and go forward. Lisa uh, highlighted that uh, she was one person and she didn't know what to do. But she learned backtrack and she actually nailed it. Think about if we all start doing in our own way. We all are, uh, no two people are same. We have our uh, positives and negatives. How about enhancing the positives? It's going to give the light. So the, the reason why I started my company last year um, was actually because I just got fed up with the industry, to be honest. Um, after my third or fourth contract, I was with a defense contractor, a major one, and I was hired as the head of the cybersecurity department. And um, my first day, I was warned that the business analyst that I was going to be working with was really intimidated by me and didn't want me to be there. And I was like, well, that's not my problem. Um, and I was warned and said, oh, you just have to deal with him. And I said, no, he's going to have to deal with me. Um, I made recommendations. I did. They had never had an internal review of their systems. I did an informal internal review, found multiple issues that would have taken down the company immediately. And I said, we need to address this. The brand new CISO was like, uh, that's not your that's not your job description. And I said, well, yes, it is. If I'm in charge of the cybersecurity department, you absolutely better believe I am not going to advocate our services to clients if we ourselves are not secure internally, we need to fix this. Um, and just was dismissed. So that was like number two, this day number two. And I was like, what the hell did I get myself into? Um, fortunately, that was Virginia. And I was like, okay, well, maybe my office in California is gonna be better. Sure enough, I come out here and I met the team. There were some women on it. I was the only woman in the cybersecurity team. And the women out here were in aerospace, totally different area, older women. and. As soon as I sat down to the table, it was like a happy hour meet and greet. The one woman, she's like, 
Oh my God, how old are you? Can you even do this job? I was so mad because I was like, how dare you? We're supposed to be on the same team here. And I got, ugh, I keep it real. I was real mad. I slapped down my veteran ID. I was like, which ID you want to check? My, here's my veteran ID. Here's my school ID. Here's my driver's license. What do you want? I was so mad by that point. I was just so disrespected the entire time. And I was like, and I warned them and I said, and they had, they made comments that were negative to the LGBTQ community. They made racist comments. They made all kinds of comments. And I warned them. I said, hey, HR, uh-uh, this is not gonna fly, I'm gone. And they didn't correct things, I left. And I was like, screw you, I'll start my own company, do things the way I wanna do it. And that's, I haven't looked back since then. It's funny, because since then, they've, they've contacted me a couple times, like, hey, do you wanna come back? Mm-mm, mm-mm. So yeah, it's really frustrating. And I was so thrilled to be at Oasis and me, you know, Lisa, especially being veterans, we are, the female veterans are invisible. Like, we go to the VA and it's like, oh, well, your husband served in which branch? I was like, I don't know, which one did yours serve in? Um, and so it's it's so frustrating, like we are the invisible. So I was so thrilled to meet Lisa and I was like, ooh, this is my girl right here and I'm at Aspen there and I was like, all right, here are my sisters. These, I'm gonna cling to them because like we're gonna change things here. So that's, be aware of things. And you know, if you don't see the, if things aren't changing, change them yourself. So I'm going to say just three things, and I'm going to get back to those two announcements. So first thing is we need something immediate, and that's what I'm dedicating myself to in 2020, uh, which is coming out here, speaking at conferences, advocating about diversity in XR environments, and just you know building these same safe, immersive environments. For that matter, first announcement, I've extended um, sort of a proposal to get Chris into XR Safety Initiative, and she's accepted. <laughs> so I am thrilled that these leaders are now lending their expertise to these emerging technologies. Now a fact about these emerging technologies. In computer science, there is a principle called garbage in, garbage out, <laughs> right? So these diversity and inclusion and other ethical uh, issues are now making their way into artificial intelligence in machine learning. And that's kind of where we also got to pay attention because everything societal is going into the databases. Those data sets are building our new systems. Inevitably, they are also going to be coding. Do we want these issues to now channel into these emerging environments? That's the point number two. So we got to pay attention to all of this, not just at a human level, but at a technological level. Now number three, and this is something really, really, I'm really happy to announce that we are now building a coalition where InfoSec Girls, WESIS, XR Safety Initiative, WIA, we are all coming together with the goal of diversity and inclusion to build that in emerging and immersive technologies. And you'll see the details later, but I wanted to mark this as a milestone for today's panel that we are gonna learn from each other and gonna try to advocate these things into immersive and emerging technologies. Governance of artificial intelligence. These guys have done remarkable things. We're gonna learn from it and then channel it into the emerging and immersive technologies. And I have also extended an invite to her, but we're still waiting, so I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. All right. And I'm also very, Glad part of um, the project. Um, sorry, I'm really thrilled about this initiative. Okay. <laughs> so we're now in the modern world, and one of the things we have to think of is we are all a part of that modern world. 
Now, one of the things that's discussed, at least in the United Kingdom, we've got a group called the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Artificial Intelligence, which meets at the House of Lords, which I also attend that. And one of the things that we look at is the fact that more and more algorithms are ruling our lives, but who is writing those algorithms and what types of biases are put into those algorithms. We also have to think about the fact that although we are here and we are now, we are still lacking in a lot of leadership roles. We are still lacking in uh, executive board positions where those board members actually have a vote. And in order to uh, maintain our modern world and improve it, we need to be there as well. Men, women, everyone and everything in between. We have to think about uh, the fact uh, we have been studying at various evidence meetings at the House of Lords, some of the software that is being used uh, using uh, algorithms here in the United States, where there was one particular case where uh, the state of Florida was using an algorithm to sentence individuals, and it was highly biased against African Americans to give them additional time. We have seen in the medical industry using IoT devices where hand sanitizers for scrub rooms for surgeons and medical staff to use, it could not detect darker skin on the hands. So we have to recognize the, te the technology is including some of the biases if we do not have diverse teams to code that, to think about how it's going to be used. We have to do this or we are going to be stuck behind with the same old, old thinking that should have already been abolished. All right, so I'm gonna keep this simple, 10 minutes. Um, <coughs> definitely don't want this to be a gripe or bash, bash session. You know, I've been lucky in my career to only have one story, but the way, all the women I know have multiple stories. So all I would say is be kind and be open, right? Is it that hard? That covers everything, diversity, all whatever, race, gender, whatever, fill in the blank. That's the bottom line, be kind and be open. That's it. Several years ago, I decided to put my money where my mouth is. So for the ISSA conference, which actually will be back here in May, and I feel like this venue can come, um, it's, two full days with four concurrent sessions, and I decided I'm gonna make sure that there's a woman leader in cyber at every time slot. And I marketed that as the Women in Security Forum. And you could filter, and that way, you know, I'm like, I'm stepping up and actually not just saying, you know, I want inclusiveness, but we're doing it. Um, and so I was successful with that. Uh, this will be like the third year doing that, and. Um, I'm really proud of that. One thing I also did was um, there's a private invite only CISO forum at the, the day before. And I always try to make sure that there are women CISOs participating and speaking. And I was shocked again because I went into LinkedIn. I start doing filtering by um, CISO or Chief Information Security Officer or CSO, whatever, in the greater Los Angeles area. And I'm scouring the list, next page, next page, page. Where the fuck are the women? <laughs> How could they not? And this is part of the problem. At the top level positions, there's not enough. I, I was shocked again. So that's got to change, really has to. I was eventually able to find some, right? To, to round out the experience, but that was terrible. And that just opened my eyes. I don't know how many of you are aware of this fact, right? You know, so we, all, we look at our field and we all, you know, it was mentioned earlier, we all know that there's not enough people to do all the work at hand. And we know it's scheduled to get worse. Geometric progression, much worse. Um, but then there's a whole workforce out there of people who would love to, but maybe, you know, they're not comfortable coming into the field. And if, and if I've seen some discussions that people had, this scenario still is taking place today, right? A young man, in elementary school is having trouble with uh, science or math. And so they'll tutor him and help him and you know, get him up to speed. A young girl is having trouble with math or science. And the counselor or the advisor or teachers, all right, you're good in English and languages. Don't worry about it. Just focus on that. 
That's still happening. That's part of the problem. So the girl initiative, right? We've got to get that started. I know there's an immediate need, but we also have to bank for the future. And we have to, if you, know, if you hear about these discussions, if you have daughters or friends who have daughters, and this, you hear about any kind of discussion in school like that, it's got to be addressed. We can't just say, oh, that's just the way people's buy. No, no, no. That's got to be changed. So at a young age, people need to be uh, you know, taught that, hey, you can shoot for the moon. You can be a leader like these women are. And you should not let anyone tell you otherwise. Now, some girls use it as incentive, but not everyone's built like that. Some people get discouraged. We have to be sensitive to that. That's really well said. I don't actually like enjoy the taste of my hand. I was just really touched. Um, uh, lead, I'm, I'm using the left hand for the mic still, people. Um, <laughs> it's just being really real. OK. Um, and so in a nutshell, the, the future is changing all that and keeping it directed forward. And continuing to increase, numbers increase, openness to what diversity means as it continues to expand, seeing the opportunity and honestly the necessity. We need people to continue to move forward. And um, a little bit of Anita. So then I looked specifically at software, at software engineers. And I found that <clears throat> software teams where there is a personality diversity makes a big difference. And so apparently, you know, the extroverts mixing it up with the introverts and, you know, uh, really does make better software. And then the third thing that I found, and this goes back to being inclusive, is that one of the really big detriments to software engineering and the thing that keeps a group from producing good software is fear, psychological fear. And that psychological safety, feeling as though you can say something and not have somebody look at you like you're stupid. <laughs> uh, and that, that you know, even if it's subtle, a little bit of bullying, people have to feel safe. And if they feel safe, then they will give an opinion, well, maybe there's another way of doing this or this and that. And you produce better software if you have a psychologically safe environment. That's it. Great. Awesome. Um, so to close up, I wanted to say that please actually do this, by the way. I'll look at each other and say, this is what the future of security looks like. And just note that and appreciate it. <coughs> and give yourselves a pat on the back. <laughs> give yourselves a round of applause. Get whatever you do to cheer. Happy dance, happy dance. You're strong people. I mean, your knowledge is far beyond what I have. Uh, I have a question because I, I spoke with Vandana about it in the past. I was trying to recruit people to my team, and I didn't get resumes from female employees, everyone, men, male. And I'm trying to figure out if I did the mistakes that you're mentioning. I grew up in a very in diverse location. I grew up in Israel. You may expect, I mean, not raised for hatred or anything, but I didn't grow up around people that were much different than I am. And I'm happy to say that my kids are growing up now in Boston area and it's amazing. I mean, my kid's best friend is from Syria and another one from Pakistan. That's awesome for me. I don't have any intention to offend anyone, but it may happen sometimes and sometimes it won't be uh, as strong women as you guys, as you are, right? What can I do? And I mean, how can I get help in the sense of I write a job description, make sure it's not offending because for me, it doesn't look like this, right? For me, it's natural. And I hope I didn't do it, right? Just trying to figure out what are the suggestions. So there's, actually, there's actually a website where you can put in a job description and see what the biases are. Cool. It's really cool. Um, I've, I've done that to showcase and kind of point out to people, 
And it's really, really cool that um, it'll show you like, ooh, what kind of language are you, oh, it's working. What kind of language are you using and how is that biased? So that's one of the coolest things that I've seen that rather than me just kind of like, you know, preaching to you, there's the science right there. Um, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but uh, Lisa, you probably, you and I hear well, all the time. Real, like Real quick, yeah. yeah. One of the things too is, um, and I'm guilty of this, we if we don't qualify for one thing on there i don't feel qualified to apply at all and that's stupid <laughs> but it's the truth so maybe you know it's about the wording you know and i think there's daydream back there and you know there's resources out there show another woman like hey how does this look does it would you you know that's the minimum you could do yeah yeah, yeah. that's a good point because uh if women feel that we're not matching even 90 percent, like 90 percent is a match then also we won't apply it like it's like it has to have a neck to neck match but if you take a perspective from the person who's working on, uh, in your team another woman or another leader i'm sure you'll get a perspective yep. maybe even if she's not working in cybersecurity she'll be able to tell you that if there are so many things we might not tend to apply yeah, and then from the other perspective, not from the employer, but for those of you in the audience who you know, will be looking for jobs or are looking for jobs, stretch your envelope, right? Do not be intimidated. You never should be resting on who you are. We should all be growing and improving. Right. And you know, if you're not matching exactly, that's fine, because so many of them are written a little unrealistically. I mean, I look at, <laughs> right? Uh, you need this, 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 and this. Who are you gonna, what? maybe there's two people around, right? Yeah, but you know, for whatever reason, um, and, and probably that would be a whole other panel. You know, women perhaps look at things more specifically and literal when it says these are the specs, and guys are like, "Eh, I, I've been bullshitting my whole life, so why not?" <laughs> but hey, I just want to give you an incredible resource. So if you turn around, there is a lady in pink. Her name is Deirdre. She's the CEO of Cyber SN. There are organizations that are recruitment agencies that dedicate themselves, just like CyberSN, literally around diversity and inclusion. So partner with those type of organizations when you're trying to recruit. Oh, and real quick, I found the, there's two sources, Text.io um, and Gender Decoder. So to take that out, and le legitimately, you can put in language, and that's not just for job descriptions, that's putting in, Hey, is your marketing geared toward males versus women? Like who you're leaving out? So check out those two sources. I really like those. They do a good job. Do any of your organizations have a job board? Oh yeah. Yeah. Is it a, okay? Daydream. <laughs> there, I mean, job descriptions should not include anything other than what's the job. Yeah. Nothing else, literally. What do you need done? What are the tasks? What are the projects that you need done? Everybody's avatar looks the same and it's genderless. You can check it out at cybersn.com. I'm certainly here to talk, but this is super important. It isn't, you know, the word game in using websites is, you know, sort of helpful, but let's just leave out all that content. Like it just, it shouldn't be there. It really should be, can you sponsor me as a, in citizenship and where's the job and how much time do I have to be in the office versus outside the office? I mean, you gotta think about passive job seekers too. So while the men may, might not, you know, would apply only if they're very serious about job searching, right? Otherwise they look at that job description and say, that sounds like a company that doesn't know anything about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so this is really an important topic and definitely wanna help. And not only am I the CEO, I'm the founder. So, and I did this privately. We're the largest firm in the US and this platform is international and we've got tons of professionals all over the world and I'm doing things with all those groups up there and I need to do more with some of them. It's been a while, Lisa. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I also uh, own and operate Secure Diversity and, and the two firms together are taking on this problem. So thank you for pointing me out. Wouldn't it be great to see an ad looking for a cybersecurity professional must be, must be an old black Jewish. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? <laughs> We won't see that. Though. Thank you very much. And remember the exercise I told you to do.